take the right door on your way down. There's no telling where you'll end up. Can you make it through? To the night's end. Interesting. That survival of the fittest hard at work there. In rural Australia, no less. The dark heart has many secrets. Many dark creatures and beings out at play. I can see that. I can only wonder what your imagination will conjure next. Who said it was my imagination? <laughs> well, I assumed... Jimmy, you should know better. The things you have locked away down here, you've no doubt got some here in your domain. (laughs) Yes, I'm sure I do. Now, fancy a bit of time travel, Jimmy? Hmm, now you've piqued my interest. Before I do, please tell me you have some beer squirreled away down here. (laughs) I might be able to help you out there. Uh, yeah. Cheers for that. All right. Story time. Bottle Green Dreams. Written by Rick Kennett. Narrated by Leanne Campbell and James Barnett. Why did you buy a box of junk? Duncan shrugged. I don't know, Judy. Just felt I had to jump in there when the bidding started. Anyway, what do you mean junk? There's some good stuff to be found in job lots. Lucky dips, I muttered. But as there hadn't been much trade that day, I set about sorting the contents of the box the moment Duncan offloaded it from our van and dragged it into the shop. Clothes went to one pile, books to another... An electric iron over here, paste jewelry over there, bottle... There. What did I say? I pulled out a green wine bottle from the bottom of the box and dusted it off with a rag. Who's coming in here looking for things like this? Duncan took it from me and rolled it in his hands, tilting it to the light to watch the bulb glow green through the glass. The manufacturer's mark is German by the looks of it. I'm pretty old if I know my trade. Could be it's a collector's item. You know... There was this bloke bidding against me for the box. Nearly pushed the price beyond my limit, too. I wonder if it was this he was after. (laughs) Likely he was a stooge. If he was any ordinary bidder, he'd have no more idea of what was in the box than you. True? Duncan didn't answer. Never does when I'm right. He just kept rolling that bottle against the light. We'd been given the shop as a wedding present by Duncan's parents five years ago. It had been in the family for generations. A sort of heirloom. A sort of joke, I thought when I first saw it. It had been many things over the years. Drapers, bicycle repairers, photographers, florists, not to mention derelict, which was how it was when we got it, run down and ratty. So we both started blind in the second-hand train, starting from scratch with little more than a sign on the window saying D and J Hooper. Licensed second-hand dealers. Only point this out to show that Duncan was no more an expert on bottles than me. It's just an empty, I said. Yeah, but the mouth's gummed up. Resin, I think. Why would anyone seal an empty bottle? Maybe there's a genie in it. Duncan held the bottle close to the side of his face and leered. A lady one, eh? Wearing a skimpy harem costume? Down, boy. I already dusted it and nothing happened. Of course nothing happened. The mouth's sealed. 
Got a pen knife handy? Leave it be, I said, grabbing it back from him. It'll have more mystery value with the resin in it. To be honest, that wasn't the real reason I stopped him from opening it. Somehow, I just thought it'd be more prudent to leave it plugged. In the long run, though, it didn't matter. Judy shook me and whispered, Duncan, Duncan, wake up. There's somebody downstairs. I reached out for her, feeling the sheets already cold. She must have been sitting up for some time listening. What time is it? I mumbled. Shh, listen. I lay there sliding slowly back into sleep, my arms still outstretched. And then I was suddenly wide awake because something was happening downstairs. There was a voice in the shop below us. I had visions of the front door smashed, the shop crowding with shotgun-wielding thugs grabbing cast-off clothes, factory seconds, discontinued lines, second-hand books and records, used furniture, haberdashery. No, they'd be after money. And as soon as they found there was none in the shop, I jumped up and locked the bedroom door. Then, as I stood pressed against it, I heard another sound, sort of faint yet steady thump, 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 like a truck engine coming up from below. Slowly, I unlocked the door again and stuck my head out. It was too dark to see anything. I couldn't hear anyone coming up the stairs, but the rumbling and the voices didn't seem to get any louder in the passage. Maybe they weren't coming from inside the shop at all. Maybe, maybe, it was just a semi-trailer broken down outside. I pulled on my trousers and threw on a jumper. Judy grabbed my shoulder. Duncan, don't be stupid. Shh. Lock the door behind me. I headed downstairs, slow and quiet. The noises were no louder nor closer downstairs. I peered around the curtain to the shop. There was no one there. I checked the street door. It was locked. There was no broken down semi outside. No one at all. Yet the voices and the thumping was still there. Never louder, never closer. Just faint and all around. I unlocked the street door, stepped outside, and the noises stopped. I looked up and down the street, listening to the night, feeling more scared now than when I thought I might be walking toward the business end of a gun, because this was a fear I couldn't put a name to. I walked back to the door, but the sounds didn't return as I half expected. I stood in the doorway, listening. Somewhere down the street I thought I heard, of all things, a horse whinnying. Though I could see nothing but streetlights and parked cars. So I ducked back in the shop and found all the stock had disappeared. Saw this plainly because, although it was midnight by my watch, the sun was streaming in through the window. Duncan, don't be stupid. But he just shrugged me off, told me to lock the door. Men. They're damn bald sometimes. I didn't close the door, but held it ajar and watched him creep down the stairs. I stood there listening, and a minute or two later I heard the front door open. Then, except for the voices and the distant engine noise, heard nothing more. Even though I must have stood at the bedroom door for a good five minutes more. By then I was getting really scared and worried. Crept down the stairs and peered around the curtain. The shop itself looked undisturbed, but the street door was wide open with no sign of Duncan anywhere. Called to him in a whisper, but got no answer. The voices and engine noises seemed to have an echoey quality about them now. Sort of metallic and they followed me as I walked to the door, never louder or closer, but just as soft as they'd been upstairs and all around. Couldn't work that out, but really wasn't paying it all that much attention. Too worried about Duncan. There was no sign of him up or down the street. I thought then he might be back in the shop, perhaps laying knocked out behind the counter. I went back inside, 
But instead of being in the shop, I found myself looking across an expanse of sea, stretching away into a haze that hid the horizon. But the sky was the worst. It was green and filled with huge, blurred shapes. I stumbled back, turned and started panicking when I couldn't find the door. Scrambling madly with my fingers and nails against some vague sort of wall, all smooth and cold like glass. Then there was the door, as if it had been there all along. I raced outside with my heart beating a mile a minute, and there was Duncan standing on the footpath, staring across the road at nothing at all. I again checked my watch. The hand stood at a little after midnight, then took another look out the window into the sudden day. A horse and cart jingled by. People in the street were wearing old-fashioned clothes. The women were especially noticeable in their long skirts and big hats. The shop was the same in its general shape, and there was still a curtained doorway in the back wall, but the stock was gone. All the shop now contained was a counter with a couple of old cameras in its display case. The floor was bare boards where it had been lino. Hanging along one side wall were black and white portrait photographs of people I didn't know. All posed stiffly, the way you see them in old time photos. Reading back to front, I saw the name on the shop window was no longer D&J Hooper, licensed second hand dealers, but William Edward Hooper and Son, photographers. William Edward Hooper, my great-great-grandfather. May I help you, sir? I spun around and saw this bloke in old-style vest and coat and trousers come pushing through the curtain from the back. For several seconds, I just stared at his ruddy face and mutton-chop whiskers until I finally heard myself say, Mr. Hooper? I am, sir. Have you come for a sitting? Sitting? This way, please. He ushered me through the curtain. I walked as if in a dream into what in my shop was a storeroom. Here it contained chairs, stools and a nondescript backdrop at one end, a black velvet covered tripod camera at the other. Something hissed quietly just above head height, gaslight jetting from cast iron brackets fixed to the wall. Many particular pose, sir. Half profile might suit you. Bewildered, I almost fell down onto one of the chairs. Yes. It was all I was able to think of to say. My mind was busy telling itself, this is not happening. For your family or sweetheart? He slid a photographic plate into the back of his camera. I suppose you're going overseas? Yes, I said again, not knowing to what. Grand, isn't it? He ducked beneath the black cloth. I envy your adventure. No doubt you'd be in Berlin by Christmas, showing them what for, eh? No doubt, Bluff, I told myself, and frantically started digging about in memory, trying to remember some family history. William Edward Hooper had been my grandfather's grandfather. James, the, and son on the window, had been my grandfather's father. But my grandfather had never known him because he died or something in New Guinea in the First World War, the month my grandfather was born. Died or something. It was all very vague, and my mind was still trying to cope. I said, Do you, uh, do you have a son named James? Yes. Said long dead great great grandfather Hooper from under the camera cloth. But he doesn't live here anymore. He joined the Navy, got married more than a year ago. Head up, sir. Yeah, that's right. Won't take a moment. His hand reached from under the cloth and uncapped the lens. Very still, sir. Very still. He recapped the lens. You wouldn't be thinking of joining the Navy yourself, would you? He asked, re-emerging. The fleet went off in a hellish hurry once the balloon went up, didn't they? Out to sea, straight away they went. James told me a year ago that when things started, they would probably go north first to capture the German colonies and sink the whole of their East Asiatic squadron. In New Guinea? New Guinea? Mr. Hooper blinked. I don't know the names of all them foreign places up there. There's a German colony to the north of us, and I expect that's where they've gone. Their print should be ready next week. Sitting in original cost, two shillings, and two sixpence for each additional print. A fair price. 
I dug into my pocket, knowing full well there was no two shilling coins in there. Shillings, along with pounds and pence, had gone out of circulation in Australia in 1966. I handed him a 20 cent piece, which I seemed to remember was the same size as an old two shilling piece, and hoped he wouldn't notice a platypus in place of whatever had been on the old money. He stared at it a moment, then looked at me with such an odd expression, and said, You know, sir, I've just had the queerest feeling about young James, but a cold clamminess came over me just now, like a freezing mist. The words from family legend, died or something, came again to mind, and I wondered what was happening in New Guinea at that very moment. I forced a smile. Fell in by Christmas, Mr. Hooper. Good day. Good day, sir. And good luck. I walked out of the shop feeling weird and unreal, but fully expecting to re-enter the night outside my shop. Instead, I found myself still in the light of the day gone nearly a hundred years. The road in front of the shop was unsealed, just dirt where it should have been bitumen, and the dirt smelt of horse dung. The street lighting was gas lamps in ornate brackets. The electricity poles held several cross braces, festooned with many insulators serving tens of wires instead of a discreet two. Houses I'd seen torn down 20 years ago stood where they'd been, shiny new. And the people in the street. The people in the street. An excitement grew among them. I could feel it where I stood. Their world was on the edge of a world-consuming war, and they were jubilant and happy. Judy, I said, felt a great cold gulf open up between us. My wife, my family, everyone I knew. Thought of being cut off of not being able to get back, filled me with fear. Where would I go? How would I manage in this long dead society? An overwhelming feeling of alienness overcame me, of being forever lost in a culture as foreign as any foreign land. The people in the street, all happy at the prospect of the coming war, passed me by as if I wasn't there. And perhaps I was to them a ghost. Maybe that's why I noticed the figure across the street. He was thin and tall and seemed familiar, though I couldn't recall from where. And he was watching me, where to everyone else I was perhaps invisible, he was watching me. His face had a stern expression, but his eyes were sad. More than sad. Regretful. Then as we looked at each other, he suddenly pushed his fists up under his chin and jutted out his thumbs. The day began to darken fast. Behind me I heard Judy shout my name. I turned toward the shop, seeing it melt into a great green blur with Judy racing out of the heart of it. It's true, said Duncan to himself, peering at a high point on the wall of the back door. This is where they were. Any other time, I would have thought he'd gone mad, making such a fuss over faint dents in the plaster, which looked like something might have been fitted there long ago. But this was a night of madness. The one more bit didn't much matter. There was nothing stronger in the house than a six-pack Duncan had been saving for the weekend. I don't usually drink beer, but that night I sat at the kitchen table and drank shot for shot with him out of shaking glasses as we told each other stories. Then we were both silent for a long time. We drank some more, and about three of you, we went up to bed. Why us? I said as we lay in the dark. Why suddenly ghosts? It's that damned gummed up bottle from the job lot box, Duncan said. This started the moment it came in here, and that bottle is the most sus thing it contained. I mean, maybe that's why it's sealed. To keep the ghosts in, except sometimes it leaks. Why should a bottle that comes from God knows where leak your great-great-grandfather? Didn't you tell me once he died of a heart attack in 1922 in this very room? Yes, okay. Look, I was just thinking out loud. I don't pretend to know about the what and how of this. I don't know why anyone would want to bottle up an old man who died of natural causes in his own bed. And I certainly don't know what any of this has to do with the sea and green skies. And where the tall bloke with the jutting thumbs comes into it is anybody's guess. 
All I'm saying is that I think the bottle's got something to do with it. That thumbs up gesture you saw him do? I felt the thinking a moment. Maybe I saw a picture of someone doing that just the other day. I was, yes. I was leafing through one of the old books we have down in the shop. I'm sure I saw it there. When Duncan made no reply, I said, too bad the bottle came in a job lot, otherwise we might have been able to find out where it came from. Yes, he said, actually agreeing with me for once. Job lots are usually the bits and pieces left over from other auctions, deceased estates, that sort of thing. Untraceable. Tomorrow, he said after a long silence. First thing, I'm going to the Bureau of Births, Deaths and Marriages to find out about James Hooper. Your great-grandfather who died or something in New Guinea in the First World War? Yes. There was another long silence, then he said, Judy, remember when I said there was something familiar about that bloke with the jutting thumbs, but I couldn't figure out what? It just occurred to me. He was the one at the auction bidding like mad for the box. An hour before dawn, the distant voices and thumping engine noises began again downstairs. While Judy opened up the shop next morning, I went into town and took a ride on the public service merry-go-round. The Bureau of Births, Deaths and Marriages said they didn't hold death certificates for war dead and directed me to the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense told me to go to service records. Service records try to send me back to births, deaths and marriages. When I told them where they could go, they scratched their heads and said, Archives. The archives building was an anonymous looking place down south in one of the seaside suburbs. A little old lady behind a pokey little counter wanted to know my whole life story, or so it seemed, and scribbled down vital details in official books before I was given a reader's card and allowed to proceed. The lower story was a musty smelling warehouse of documents and ledgers and stuff. On the upper story, I was ushered into the search room where there was another counter and more questions about who and what and where and when. Luckily, they didn't ask why, and it was here that I eventually found my missing great-grandfather James Hooper. His death certificate gave the place as Rabol, New Guinea, and the date was 14 September 1914. Cause of death was listed as missing, presumed lost at sea. I read it again in disbelief. After all that chasing around, all I got was a vague, lost at sea. The hell did that mean? Did he fall overboard? Did he go down with his ship? Was he there on deck one minute and bottled the next? So now I had to find out what happened at Rabaul on 14 September 1914. Without specific information, such as the name of James's ship, archives couldn't help me any further, though they suggested the public library down the road. So that's where I went, and on the way I phoned Judy. Yes, it was lost at sea on 14 September 1914. Rabaul. Rabaul. Yes, it's sort of on the north coast of New Guinea. It didn't say. I'm on the way to the library to find out more. Yes. You did? What did it say? Who? Well, that's the sort of thing we should expect with something like this. Good idea. What's his name again? How do you spell it? C. Yes. R. O. W. L. E. Y. Crowley. Before Duncan left that morning, we both had a good long look at the bottle. There's something being scratched into this resin seal, he said, peering closely at it. Looks like writing, but done really small. Be careful, I said. Don't put your face so close to its mouth. 
Nothing's going to reach out and grab me, he said, although he moved the bottle a little further from his face as did it. I wonder what would happen if we broke it. I don't think that's a good idea, I said, surprised at the near panic in my voice. He looked at me a moment, sort of thoughtful. Would you rather I threw it away? The truthful answer would have been yes, emphatic and immediate. Instead, I lumped down a chair and said, I don't know. These aren't the sort of questions you expect to have to answer in everyday life. So for the time being, we stowed the bottle under the counter. Then Duncan went in search of his great-grandfather down at birth, deaths and marriages, and I opened the shop like it was just another day. There wasn't exactly a crowd waiting for the door to open, so I had time to rummage through the stock to find those jutting thumbs pictures I remembered seeing. Found it after a few minutes in a book called Magic and Those Who Use It. The photo was of a man named Crowley, a self-styled sorcerer who lived around the turn of the 20th century. He'd been the inventor of a new religion, had influenced spiritualist lodges in England and France, not necessarily for the better, and for a short time was the guru of a rabid magical occult society in Germany, and these were just his good points. Duncan rang in the afternoon. Did you find James Hooper? Where? Where? Rabul? What's that? How did it happen? Good. I've got some news to send too. Yes, found that thumbs picture. It was a magical gesture used by a heavy magician called Alistair Crowley in the early part of the century. Crowley, a nasty sort by the sounds of things. Not someone I'd trust to leave in charge of the shop for an hour, if you know what I mean. Yes, I suppose. Say, while you're at the library, how about seeing what you can find out about him? Later that afternoon, I opened Magic and those who use it again and had another look at the chapter on Crowley. I described him to Duncan as a nasty sword, but now as I read it again, I thought, could have, should have, added, dangerous. Do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law, had been his philosophy which the book interpreted as meaning let nothing, literally nothing, stand in the way of your goal or potential. And although it seemed ridiculous, I had this nagging worry that I should have given Duncan some sort of warning. But against what? According to the book, Crowley was long dead. It was while rereading the Crowley chapter, and in particular pondering that bit about being the guru of a rabid magical occult society in Germany, that a thin, tall man came to the shop and said in a German accent, Good afternoon. I am looking for bottles. Judy, you're not going to believe it came slamming through the door in a heat of excitement. Judy came out from the back through the curtain and watched me without expression as I leaped around like an idiot kid. I banged some sheets of paper down on the counter in front of her. Just take a look at this. She picked up the sheets, one by one, then casting them aside. These are photocopied from a book on the Australian Navy during the First World War, I said, snatching up the papers again. I think we're really onto something here, Judy. Listen to this. At 7am, 14 September 1914, the submarine AE-1 left for Ball Harbour to patrol east of Cape Gazelle with the destroyer Parramatta. General orders for both vessels were to patrol the vicinity for enemy vessels and return to harbour before dark. The harbour had remained smooth, and although the day had begun to clear, haziness had by mid-afternoon restricted visibility to five miles. At 3.20, AE-1 headed back towards Rabaul Harbour, but was lost sight of in a thickening mist that gathered around her. By 8pm, AE-1 had still not reached port. A search was immediately instigated along the coast of New Ireland and New Britain, and in all neighbouring waters for 30 miles northwest of Duke of York Island. But no trace of AE-1 was ever found, and her disappearance remains one of the ongoing mysteries of the sea. Judy said something which I only later realised was, I know. 
but right then I was too full of my own discovery. But that's not the half of it. In a book about the Australian occupation of Rabaul, in late 1914 I found this. Rather grandly I pushed another copy under Judy's nose. It showed a tall and sullen looking German officer, probably about 30 or so, standing in a jungle clearing. The caption read, Captain Wolfgang Einhardt was the last of the German militia at Rabaul to be taken prisoner. He was captured on Duke of York Island in late September 1914, having successfully evaded the occupational forces for two weeks. This is him. This was who I saw across the street making the fists and thumbs gesture. Judy, this was the bloke bidding against me for that damned box. This picture was taken all that time ago, yet he's hardly aged at all. Do you know what this means? Yes, Duncan. She said. I know exactly what it means. Mr. Einhardt has had all those years to think over what he did in his youth. And as he said to me a couple of hours ago, that's far too long for any one man to regret. That's why I gave him back the bottle. All my excitement suddenly dropped away. What? He said it's best if we let them sleep. Let who sleep? Who do you think? I see now what the consequences would have been had we broke the seal on the bottle. You know what it was like to feel suddenly displaced out of your own time? Only today would be much more alien for them with no way back. I believe Mr. Einhardt was right when he told me they would suicide or go mad, or be taken away and studied by those who'd like to know more about messing with stuff like this. He was very apologetic and asked me to give you these. Judy pushed a couple of items along the counter. One was a tarnished 20 cent piece. The other was something I first took to be a piece of card, stained and yellowed with age. Along the bottom was written in fresh biro, when blood called to blood down the years. And above that stamped in faded ink, William Hooper and Son, photographers. I turned it over, and Judy and I stared at that ancient photograph of me for a long time. You've been listening to The Dark Heart, which is a production of Dissonance Media. Bottle Green Dreams was written by Rick Kennett, who is an Australian writer of science fiction, horror, and ghost stories, with several published books and many stories in a wide variety of magazines, anthologies, and podcasts. The novella The Devil and the Deep Blue Sea and the novella In Quinn's Paddock feature his reoccurring character Ernie Pine, the reluctant ghost hunter. Another recurring character is genetically engineered Martian space girl, Cy de Gersh, who appears in the novel Presumed Dead and the collection 30 Minutes for New Hell. Some of Kenneth's work is science fiction, but some of his science fiction stories feature ghosts. Thus his work crosses genre boundaries that are often kept separate. For more on Rick, head to rickkennett.wordpress.com or head to his Amazon page to purchase some of his work. Link is in the show notes. Judy was performed by Leanne Campbell. Duncan was performed by James Barnett. Mr. Hooper was performed by Scott Davidson. Mr. Einhardt was performed by Brian Jeans. This episode was produced and edited by James Barnett. Thank you all for listening. If you want to support The Night's End, for as little as $1 a month, you can support our show on Patreon where you can receive bonus episodes. If you want to write for The Night's End, why not head to nightsend.com for more details on submissions. And as always, stay horrific, everyone.